Um, John, I want to thank you for joining us and for allowing us to watch that with you. Um, it's a really special film and we're honored to have you here. I'm thrilled to watch it. I'm a graduate student in the Documentary Expression Program, so of course I have lots of questions about the content, but also the filmmaking process. Um, so to kick us off, I wonder if you might tell us a bit about the context of this film. What films were you looking at? And what was the process of determining the nature of it? Um, you've got some experimental expression going on in there. What did all of that decision making look like? Yeah, in, in many regards, it's so exciting to have the film screen here. And last time I was here nine years ago was for the SFA symposium um, when John T had invited me um, for the John Egerton prize and this was like a seedling of an idea you know I I was really leading leaning into the physical environment the land the food ways and, and the spirituality and I actually intended this to be a film with no people um, so um, that's what I was doing <laughs> I was eating well and sit, sitting in nature and composing these like very long takes um, I was inspired by the um, Obviously, in the, in the title, it is a, is a spin on Ross McAvee's film, um, Sherman's March to Sea, um, which, of course, I love. And I also love his film, Bright Leaves. And I was living in Durham at that time. So a lot of meditation on his work. <laughs> and so it started as a joke in many regards. I was like, well, I'm going to make a film just like Sherman's March. Like, I'm going to find some money, <laughs> and I'm going to go home and tell a story. Um, but just this time when we go to Charleston, we're gonna see some black people. Because I was like, it's amazing that he went to South Carolina and there's one scene with black people um, in the school. Um, so that was my thinking. And so when 2014, that's when I started this, um, summer 2015, the shooting in Charleston happened. And so I, I was already making a different film. You know, I was already making a film about land. Um, and, and so I, one of my professors, I was actually his TA at the time, Marco Williams, um, you know, told me that I didn't have the luxury to make an experimental film on this subject matter. Um, <laughs> and so in, in many ways, I, I took that as a, a challenge, which I accepted, and, and I sort of, um, started working in multiple modalities. And so um, I, I really didn't film in the direct aftermath of the shooting because of the way that national media and film crews and others sort of descended upon Charleston and not wanting to be mistaken for them. And so I kind of put my camera down at that point and so it wasn't until a few weeks after the shooting that I started doing oral histories with community members. And, and that was the first time I was like doing interview setups. And then, um, you know, over the course of several years making the film, I returned and did more constructed scenes like the scene in New York um, and then the portraits of families on their land, which I did during COVID. Um, so yeah, th th there were multiple different eras of production. <laughs> and. I sort of um, always knew it would have a collage aspect to it, and so I, I kind of kept all the material and used that um, for this. Yeah, and so you touched on something else I was curious about, and you know, we're sitting in the School of Journalism, and um, you obviously have a good bit of archival footage and newspaper headlines in your film. Um, I'm curious, how you feel about the distinction between journalism and documentary, and do you see this as a kind of, as a form of activism? Um, but you've also touched on, or your characters in the film touch on this, the importance of forgiveness, which is something that so many of us, you know, would be baffled at in that circumstance. And so, um, so how do you see activism take place in your filmmaking process? Well, I'm obviously incredibly biased. I respect journalism a lot. I wanted to be a journalist, a photojournalist. But um, when I was my senior year at the new school at Parsons in New York, um, I had an internship opportunity with 
New York Magazine, and then I had a film professor who told me that print would be dead, and I better learn how to edit. <laughs> so I, so I, I took a final cut class instead of that internship. Um, but with, with that in mind, you know, a lot of respect for journalism, but the documentary process is slow, you know. So just like slow food, you know, it's like. It's, it's a different thing, and, and you can have fast food and be satiated, but you know, you might have a heart attack later. <laughs> but no, no um, it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's the ability to return. It's a privilege to, to be able to work in, in that mode, you know, to spend that much time with people and with an idea and not have a, a deadline that's looming. Um, so that's just the distinction that I see, you know, like each serves its, its purpose in sort of the, the public square, but I think for independent voices to, to really um, find their own tone, it, it takes time. Yeah, um, speaking of independent voices in town, um, the chapter, I'm going to call it a chapter, where the um, text appears on the screen and we hear the characters speaking in the Gullah Geechee accents, defending their culture, defending their way of speaking, but also talking about being mocked by other people. Um, and it reminds me a lot of some of the captioning that we've seen in documentaries about the Delta or other Southern documentaries where accents play you know, a heavy part. So you use text very strategically, and I wonder if um, you might consider or discuss the politics of captioning um, and where and why you've chosen to use text in the way that you did. I think for um, accessibility purposes, I clearly believe in access, and, you know, um, for, for people with different hearing and, and visual abilities. So that aside, like I, I constructed the film where no, no single track was privileged, you know? So to me, the image sits alone, the, the dialogue track sits alone, the score sits alone, the ambient sound sits alone, and they all tell their own story. And so that's why even there, even the way in which we enter and leave conversations isn't clear because that's intentional. It, to me, it's not as much about what's being said, but the experience that one is having encountering any, any of these elements. And so I like to say in real life, you know, we, people don't walk around with captions, you know, and so part of it is thick accent, part of it is speech impediments. And, you know, when we encounter someone who we don't understand clearly, in our in the real world, you know, we, we just ask them to repeat themselves. We listen closer, you know, like we, we have all these other techniques to understand. And, I, and because I'm not privileging the explicit information being conveyed, I feel like that that an, a viewer can do the same. You know, you may not understand. You might feel the rhythm of it. You might discern some of it. You know, and, and that's fine. And I think. Being in the Southern Studies Department, we think a lot about insider versus outsider dynamics and um, the conversations that you have in New York, um, people you know, talking about never wanting to return back home and then some returning back home, um, but also thinking about how we do understand the South today as, in a way, being everywhere beneath the Canada line. And so... I wonder if there is a correlation between um, thinking about the specificity of the landscape here um, while also contextualizing it in a story that feels really American. Yeah. I mean, Randall Keenan would talk about the geography of nowhere and sort of the flattening of the South where, you know, Knoxville may look a lot like, you know, Springfield, Massachusetts or Dearborn, Michigan, you know, and it's like hard to discern when it's the same establishments, you know, the same architecture, but there is still something very distinct uh, about the South, 
you know, and, and so I think place is incredibly important. Um, and so, yeah, I think in, in the geography of my South or my Southern <laughs> um, identity, like my um, mentor Tom Rankin has assured me many times that I am Southern. Um, but <laughs> You know, and and it's weird because like I'll be in the Northeast and people will be like, "Where are you from?" Like your accent. I'll be in Los Angeles and be like, "Are you from Chicago?" <laughs> I'll go to Chicago. They're like, "Are you from Los Angeles?" And so it's like always like this confusion around <laughs> my my own accent. But but that idea that like um, you know these strands of identity that are distinctly American that are distinctly Southern at times, um, you know, are, are unique. And for a lot of distributors and folks when I was making the film, that was a huge problem. They were like, this is such an American story that will never have an audience elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's on Maori public television. It had its premiere at BFI London Film Festival. And, you know, in all of those places that I've been, people have told me, wow, this feels very familiar, this story, you know? <laughs> and so I think it's, it, it, as American as it is, it's still um, an expression of experiences in the modern world. Do you find that it's received differently abroad? Oh, yeah. It's, it's actually received with a little more earnestness. <laughs> it's... Um, because the, the curiosity is there, and and I think people are trying to locate like that connective um, tissue between their own experience, and so it, it's it has a different reception, but I, I think it's received well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I wanted also to ask you about your decision to include yourself, sorry, yourself in the film. Not my decision. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And we see you silently in a lot of the imagery at first, and then we see you in conversation with your father. Um, I'm curious if you feel that this is your story. Is it your father's story? Where do you fit in in this narrative? It's funny. Andy and I were talking about the difference between my thesis version of the film. And actually, in the original version of the film, I was not a character. My friend Elijah, who I went crabbing with, was the other protagonist alongside mm. my dad. So I was not in early versions of the film. That was like a demand, <laughs> you know, um, for people to like understand the point of view or perspective. And so the way in which I appear is my own protest, you know, because I, I, I didn't want to narrate it. I didn't want to be in it. And so I was like, okay, I'll be in it, but I'll turn my back, you know. Um, I'll talk, but I'm going to whisper, you know. It's like that's me being difficult with myself because I made it by myself mostly, you know, so it's like I, I was making it harder on myself and, and sort of my desire not to be in it. But um, that was a, a journey and, and a growing process. And um, I settled on something that I felt comfortable with rather than having to, you know, be explicit about my, my presence. Mm. This time watching it, I was struck by the mention of Kodak in the storyline, Kodak in Rochester. Yeah. Um, was there any, was there an intentional decision behind picking up a camera, including yourself as a filmmaker in the storyline with that in your, I guess, personal history? Absolutely, I mean, for context, I mean, my dad was offered like what I guess now would be considered a like <laughs> DEI, Senior Vice President position at Kodak. <laughs> I mean, it had a different title in the 90s, but um, you know, he turned it down. And same thing for the other companies that he, he brought similar um, suits against, Xerox, um, Tops, which is a grocery store um, chain. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> it, it was always looming. And so as a result, like my dad sat on the external board for Kodak for many years, um, and so we would receive all these Kodak gifts. Like we had all the early Kodak digital cameras and like the ones you put the floppy disk in, and then the, um, we had all the printers when they came out, the digital printers, and so Kodak was always there. Obviously, we lived in Rochester, everyone worked there. 
Um, I shot it on Kodak film, although I made it look more like Fuji film with the blues and greens on purpose. Um, but, you know, so yeah, it, I, I knew it would play a role, but I didn't know how it would show up. It was really hard to, to get a lot of the archival because um, we did that process during COVID and the, mm. and the newsrooms were closed. And so we couldn't access a lot of those libraries. Mm. Yeah. That's really interesting. So I want to turn it over to the audience to see if anybody else has questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, legibility, I mean, it, it still had to, um, for better or worse, I mean, it was a multi-hundred thousand dollar film over many years and many funders. And so it, th there was a deliverable of a film that would be, you know, <laughs> viewed by audiences. And so I, I had to respect that and respect the type of platforms on which it would um, be exhibited. Um, especially it, like my co-production with public television what came before I completed the film. So we, we were a licensed film by POV. We were a, a co-production. So, you know, it's like I knew it was going to go to public television. And so I, I, I started making choices for that audience. I think the the intimacy is the the nuance, <laughs> you know, like many ideals are being held in at a at a single moment, and nothing is being explained, and, and and that creates intimacy. You know, I think a lot of the distance comes from the analysis being pronounced and foregrounded in a lot of work, you know, and and I think places as complicated as America <laughs> and. and many of its communities, you know, deserve nuance, you know, and, and deserve complexity. And even in the process of making the film, I, I was asked many times to e extract thematic ideas from it, that I, that I had many films here and I was overbearing <laughs> people by putting so much in the container. And I always say, well, if I can grapple with all of these thoughts and ideas in the course of a day, certainly someone can do it in, in an hour and a half, you know? Um, so that's how I dealt with it, you know? It's like um, going back to like my Flaherty seminars day, it's like Robert Flaherty, and the whole original idea of documentary was that it was not explicitly defined, that there was no preconception, you know, that we're entering the technology, we're entering the artistry and the ideas with an open mind because we don't know the possibilities that exist. And then um, one of my favorite filmmakers, William Greaves, would compare the camera to an electron microscope, you know? And as soon as you put the, you know, the specimen underneath the micro microscope, it disperses and it already, the instrument changes the reality, you know? And so I think by accepting and owning that we're engaging with this technical process and we don't know how someone may respond to a pairing of an image and a sound and, you know, <laughs> in a, a musical note, like that's happening on many levels that we don't control and that's different for every everybody. And so I, I think for me, it's insider, outsider, but it's also like the ability to um, be comfortable with nuance and, and complexity. Yeah, it all depends on how you view yourself as a maker. If you're an artist, you gotta protect your art, you know, make what you wanna make no matter what, you know? I mean, getting funding is one thing. Like I, I wrote a lot of things in grant applications. I had sizzle reels that, you know, looked more like true crime, you know, and things that made me cringe. 
like I, I couldn't even watch it, but I was following the advice of experts. And you know, they were like, you need, you need to do the, the, the you know, Freedom of Information Act and get all the calls. And I did all that. I, I've never listened to it. You know, I never opened the, the, the CD or DVD, you know, to look at the files. It's still sitting in my closet, you know. Um, but I had some of the recordings, like, electronically. And so that's the work sample I used. They were like, you need police sirens. You need 911. Um, and I used that. And I was like, none of this will be in my film. Like, I, I told myself that every time I, I had to share it internally, you know. And, and, you know, because I had to make the film, and it's like without any private equity, I had to conform to the constraints of that funding model. And, um, but, you know, there's also like documentary that is, you know, commercial content to entertain, and you, you can do different choices there. Sometimes it's a document. You know, like where, like just a simple act that it exists as recorded material in of itself before you even edit or manipulate it is important. And so I think it's all about what the filmmaker wants and how they view their work um, moving through the world. But yeah, I think funding and all of that is completely separate from making, you know. That, that was that was the hope because I mean the other ways that it could have been made weren't as exciting to me personally and I mean as much as people feel like it's personal and intimate you know like it's such a construction because there's so little biographical or autobiographical information you know like people are like oh that's like a biography of your dad I was like where did he go to school what did he study, <laughs> you know, like, where did he work? You know, like, none of those things are, are present, but, you know, the guise of intimacy through, like, the, the home movies and personal photos, that, that was in, intentional. And I, and I was using my family as a stand-in for other families, you know, so I, I found the points of commonality. Like, when my friend Elijah was gonna be the protagonist, the story was exactly the same. I mean, there's portions in my narration that were actually from an interview with him, you know? <laughs> but when we removed him, it was like weird to keep it. So yeah, it was very much a construct and intended to be an intimate conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.